If I might uh, make a redaction, um, I used a word which probably was ill-advised. You shouldn't use the word limit when talking about God's character. Uh, a better word would be God has declared who he is. And in that declaration, he's also declared what he is not. And uh, we find that in 1 John chapter 1, God is light and in him there is no darkness whatsoever. Now, Indian Hindu monism cannot say the same thing. For in Indian monism, the gods embrace evil as well. And so that's perfectly depicted by the Indian Hindu goddess Kali, who has depicted by a necklace of skulls around her neck. She is death, she is cruelty, she is terror. And so even within the panoply of, of, of Hindu gods, you also have cruelty and death. And so our God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So replace that with the word limit, would you? <laughs> okay. All right, in your notes, uh, it's point of contact. And this is a really vital uh, area of presuppositional apologetics. What is our point of contact with the unbeliever? This will affect your approach to evangelism. Does the unbeliever mostly need data? Is the unbeliever a seeker? Does the unbeliever need relief for his suffering? What is our initial approach in declaring the gospel? What's the interface between God's truth and the unbeliever? What does that interface look like? Well, we begin with Roman numeral one, the embrace the antithesis. Antithesis simply means a tension between truth and error, a mutual exclusion between truth and error. Antithesis would be opposites, mutually exclusive, truth and error. And so we must embrace the antithesis. You'll notice in almost every trench story I told, stories from the trenches, I was bringing out the, the contrast between truth and error. And it, it's a powerful tool. And I mentioned on Friday night that Jesus did this. If you look in John 3 through 12, constantly Jesus is contrasting truth and error, setting them up in a mutually exclusive situation. Now, since the unbeliever begins with self in his or her attempt to locate what is true, we want to emphasize that the beginning point for knowledge must be God and not self. If you make self the beginning point, you're going to end up not being able to find the truth. In fact, if self is your starting point, you sentence yourself to a life of error. For the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. There's only one God-approved gateway to knowledge, and that's the fear of the Lord. Now, when we say fear the Lord, we mean that God is to be reverenced and feared because he is the great judge. He's holy and righteous, and he's going to call every deed into an account, into account. And uh, the level of comprehensiveness of that judgment will be startling. Every idle word. You look at the Sermon on the Mount and how comprehensive is that judgment? It extends to thoughts, motives, deeds of the heart, looks, thoughts, intents. It's quite frightening. We should be frightened. That word fear the Lord means at times quake. For God is in charge of enforcing moral cause and effect. And in so doing, he will bring every account, he will bring every act into an account if it's not forgiven by Christ. Well, back to the cigar store. I was at the cigar store witnessing one day, and there was only two people in the cigar store. Myself and a pilot, a charter jet pilot, who happened to be, you're not going to believe this, Benny Hinn's charter pilot. <laughs> now, he's, this pilot is not saved. He knows I'm a pastor, and so he was trying to kind of poke me because we were looking up at the TV monitor and there was something happening in the Middle East and you see a bunch of smoke and grenades going off on the TV screen. He goes, man, look at that. The world sure is blank, 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 blank. Sort of implying that my God was out of control. My response to him was, Soren, because this is God's world, if you sow thorns, you will reap thorns. Now that's all I said, but it completely arrested him. Because it's God's world, if you sow thorns, you reap thorns. Because this is God's world, ideas have consequences. Because this is God's world, ideas are not simply social constructs. They're either of the truth or of the error. 
of, of the truth or of a lie. And they have immense consequences, most eternal. It, it was very arresting for him to hear that. Okay, letter A under Roman number one. How do we know what we know? And again, I'll use a big word on you here, epistemology. That is the study, philosophically and religious philosophy also. How do we know what we know with any certainty at all? I was debating an atheist at the cigar store, and uh, he thought he had a good argument against Christianity. He goes, how do I know? that I'm not just dreaming you guys right now. I'm not really in a cigar store. You're not really here. It's all in my dream. <laughs> I said, according to your worldview, you don't know. You might be dreaming. But according to biblical worldview, we are created to have a correspondence between what God has declared and what we experience. He gave us a mind. He planted understanding in the innermost being, it says in Job. And he did so that we might be faithful stewards of the works of his hands and rule over what he's created and steward them. That's called the dominion mandate after Psalm 8. We are to have dominion in a way that glorifies God and therefore God gave us sensory abilities that are pretty reliable on what's going on and what needs to be done in terms of caring for the earth. And he had no answer. His little dream thing fell flat. <laughs> so our method of knowing is called epistemology. How do we know what we know with certainty. When we're uh, talking to the unbeliever about his proclaimed beliefs, we must always eventually take the argument to his method of knowing. Because you'll find out that the argument really is not about worldview, it's not a debate over facts, it always comes down to a method of knowing. Either the starting place is what God has said infallibly in his word, or the starting place is self and self's opinions. Now, if you read books by Francis Schaeffer about the contributions every philosopher has made, Hegel and Marx and Spinoza and Kant and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, you read what each of these philosophers contributed to Western thought, you'll understand how the mind was split into upper story subjective ideas and lower story concrete ideas. You'll understand how the mind was split. And this really gives us some insights into epistemology. Now, Tony and I were talking on the break how Nancy Piercy writes really great books on worldview. And I, I'm really grateful for her ministry because she studied under Francis Schaeffer and she's basically brought Schaeffer's thought into the 21st century so that we can understand the Western mind. How did the Western mind get split so that fact and value have no proper communication? Everything in the upper story is subjective. It's just your ideas, has no concrete fact Fact is things we can put under a microscope, weigh and measure and so on. How did that mind get split? Well, the contribution of these different philosophers had a lot to do with it. And so when we proclaim Christ, our unsaved friends are shoving our ideas into an upper story, subjective, unreliable category. Don't really believe those has any existence at all. They're just ideas floating somewhere. Well, the famous 20th century sociologist Peter Berger referred to truth, beauty, justice, love, logic, uniformity, good, evil as transcendentals. In other words, those are real things, but you can't trace them to the elemental table. They're not properties of carbon or sulfur or lithium. These are real things, truth, beauty, justice, love, goodness, justice, but they don't have a material cause. And so Peter Berger said, that's the sacred canopy hanging over all men, these transcendentals. They're called transcendentals because they transcend the material. They don't have a material source. You can't say they're a product of what happens when sulfur and oxygen get together or something else, but they're real. And every single unbelieving friend of yours treats them as if they're real even though they embrace a philosophy that they're not real. Your unbelieving friend only sees them as social constructs, but they live as if they're real. When they kiss their wife goodbye and go to work, they're not saying, my marital love is based slowly on what my hormone, or solely on what my hormones are doing. They believe that love really exists. So what has happened? Secular philosophy 
has raised up such a gray cloud that people can, can't see the sacred canopy anymore. They can't see those transcendentals as the very basis of life, the very meaning of human existence. They can't see that truth and beauty and love and justice and logic and uniformity are the very foundation of what it means to be human. And so in our debate with an unbeliever, it must go beyond the meaning of facts. If you're only debating the meaning of facts, and I know there's a place to talk about textual criticism and a place to talk about archaeology and fulfill prophecy and so on, but if we only talk about the meaning of facts and debate there, the conversation never leaves the realm of probability. If it's going to leave the realm of probability, you've got to drill deep enough to get down to epistemology. How do you know what you know? And so when I put an unbeliever on the spot, lovingly, I will say, well, what's your source of authority? What is informing you? What is your final source of authority? You know what they get down to usually? After we've dismissed the science argument, myself. They'll finally admit that their ultimate source of authority is themselves. Uh, in my laptop briefcase back there, if maybe you could reach in there. Yeah, there's an orange box right there. If you could just pass that up front or just sort of throw it gingerly. <laughs> and I got this in Nepal, this box. And sometimes I'll bring this when I'm witnessing. I'll say to my unsaved friend, so if self is the final source of authority, the final reference point for what is true, real, right, and wrong, how do you know that you're not deceived? Because 99.99999, it just keeps going, percent of phenomenon are beyond your observation. So you're basically trusting yourself and experts for your worldview. I want to ask you a question. Can you tell me what's in this box? And they'll say, I say, I'll even let you shake it. They'll go, is it a coin? No. A button? No. After they say, I have no idea what's in the box, and I go, then how can you tell me what's in the rest of the world and the rest of the cosmos if you don't know what's in this box? See, it just sort of puts things in perspective a little bit. If you can't tell me what's in this box... Now, Bill and I had a conversation on the break, and I got that idea, admittedly, from Craig Beale. <laughs> it's a book. And tell us the name of the book. It's in the box. <laughs> That's the name of the book. <laughs> well, what's in here is actually a Los Angeles police badge is what's in here. You never would have guessed that, would you? <laughs> okay. So it puts things into perspective how absurd it is to make self the final authoritative referential point when it has to be God himself. Only God has all the facts and all the interpretations of all the facts. Therefore, as Cornelius Van Til used to say, how can you predicate or assert something as absolutely true if you aren't connected to someone who knows truth absolutely? That's so powerful. And so the unbeliever likes to make what we call superstatements. A superstatement is a massive statement that has no basis in fact. It's, com it's taken completely on faith. It's a heart commitment joined to independence from God. <clears throat> so one's method of knowing reveals one's starting point. Your method of knowing reveals if you're starting with self or with God's infallible self-revelation. I know I keep telling a lot of stories in this sequence, but uh, I want to give you some anchor points because these doctrines, they're just sort of difficult to, to digest if we don't have examples. Um, I was on a flight from uh, Africa to, no, I was on a flight from Frankfurt, Germany to San Francisco, and uh, I saw some people in the back speaking German. And I thought, okay, I bet these guys speak English better than some of my friends in L.A., even though they're talking German. So I'm back there and I said, gentlemen, do you speak English? Yes, yes. One guy was uh, uh, going on vacation. Another guy was deadheading. He was an Airbus pilot for uh, Lufthansa. And so I said, hey, I, I just got done doing some missionary work in Africa. Would you mind if I asked you a 
religious question. They kind of took a half a step backward. Okay, okay, go for it. I said, <clears throat> if questions like, why are we here? Why is there evil death and suffering? Is God knowable? What happens when you die? Where do we come from? If questions like that are answered by the Bible, why don't you read the Bible? Answer, it's just like any other book a collect about, about uh, morals. It's just a collection of moral advice. I said, may I offer this correction for you? It's actually total truth about total reality. I'll just give you one question. What is the conscience? What does it do and where does it come from? They couldn't answer it. Let me tell you what the conscience is from Scripture. It's God's moral mark upon us. He put his moral mark upon us. It's designed to weigh our actions. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 2, the conscience is busy all day long evaluating every ethical decision you make. Whether you cheat on something or speeding or refuse to call your friend back when you promised, your conscience is busy all day long evaluating every ethical decision either accusing or defending all your choices. Life is ethical in its very core. And this guy goes, well, maybe I should take another look at the Bible. Because he couldn't answer what the conscience was. One of the most central faculties in our being. And so in asking questions like that, uh, we are bringing their epistemology to the surface so we can discuss their starting point. We want people to become aware I'll use a big term on you, epistemologically self-conscious. We want them to become aware that their starting point is self and not God's self-revelation. All right, letter C in your outline. Christian worldview is the only key that fits the lock of human experience. Nothing else can absolutely explain our existence. It just can't. I was on a flight and I talked to a gentleman sitting next to me, a very handsome, well-built gentleman. He said he played football for Coe College in Iowa. He had just graduated. I said, what was your major? Ecology. His name was Danny. I said, Danny, are you an evolutionist? He goes, yes. I said, Danny, do you try to be a consistent evolutionist? He goes, I really do. <laughs> I said, well, Danny, what are you doing flying to California? He says, well, my girlfriend lives in Santa Barbara. We're going to spend a, a few days together. I said, Danny, do you believe that all of your communications with your girlfriend are just basically mental mutations determined by nature that have no real significance whatsoever, that you're just a biological robot and your words are coming from low voltage electricity as your neurons bridge their synapses and it's just nothing but something nature determined. He goes, I don't believe that for a moment. I said, well, then you're not a consistent evolutionist. Because if you're totally determined by nature, then the whole possibility of transcending nature and being a, an independent moral free agent with culpability is impossible. And if we only go with evolution, even the worst criminals are only carrying out a mental predisposition because all you have is a physical brain and no mind and no soul. How do you argue for guilt and crime? Can't you just say, well, the pedophile was predisposed. We've got to take him off the hook. So he started seeing how inconsistent his evolution was with the moral and ethical lifestyle. We can point things like that out. He, he basically wanted to hear more. So we go forth with the confidence that the Bible answers every ultimate question. And it does so with absolute epistemological confidence. So one of the terms we use in apologetics is if you're going to represent the Bible faithfully, you must not neglect Christ's epistemic authority. Christ is God's light. You see, in the Garden of Eden before the fall, there was a teacher-pupil relationship between God and our first parents. The fall wrecked that teacher-pupil relationship. 
and mankind went following his own darkness instead. But only is that teacher-pupil relationship restored through Christ and regeneration. We become instructed by God again. We think of the promises in the Old Testament where God says, I'm your teacher. I'll teach you to profit. I'm your teacher. You can't put one foot in front of another properly unless I'm your teacher when it comes to eternal things. Well, I took my family to Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley on President's Day a few years ago. And everybody was, uh, it was really crowded. One gentleman was dressed like George Washington, right down to the silk stockings, the buckle shoes, and the knickers, <laughs> and the powdered wig. He even was giving a speech. Children were Google-eyed. They just couldn't believe it. They thought George Washington had come back. <laughs> there were reporters traveling around from TV stations with video cameras going. One of them came up to me and said, hey, we're just asking questions about free speech. Would you answer a couple of questions? So I answered their questions and they put it on video and I said, well, since you believe in free speech, can I make a free speech statement? <laughs> she said, sure, go ahead. I said, here it is. God's authoritative mouthpiece is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has definitively, he has definitively told us what is true and what is real and what is right and what is wrong, if we refuse to listen to him, we sentence ourselves to drift on a shoreless sea of relativism. Now her response kind of amazed me. She was from a local TV station in Ventura, California. She said, that's one of the most profound things I've ever heard. Would you sign this video release form? We're gonna put it on the news tonight with the rest of the video feed. Well, I watched the news from Ventura and they didn't put me on. <laughs> what I want you to see is this. You must give Christ his due as epistemic Lord of all knowledge. You must give him his due. This must come into your witness. He is Lord of all knowledge because the unbeliever starting place is self and self's opinions and self's addiction to independence from God. And so Christ is God's light. He is God's light. In thy light, we see light. Otherwise, we are in our own darkened state. It's interesting that uh, John Calvin said that uh, self is a very dangerous place to mill around in. It's like a labyrinth with no escape. If you look for meaning and dignity, and purpose and identity, only by going into self, you will wander in that maze forever. Only Christ can take you out of that labyrinth of self, was, was Calvin's argument. All right, letter D. There are certain attributes of God known to every human being. This is part of what we called correspondence. When the unbeliever hears your witness, a work of correspondence is going on between his conscience and the gospel. And so what truth is the unbeliever suppressing according to Romans 1.18? The unbeliever is suppressing the knowledge of God. For God has made it evident to him and evident within him. So God's divine nature, his power, his wisdom, his goodness are all made clear in creation and conscience. The unbeliever is suppressing those things. So I go into every witnessing situation confident that the unbeliever already knows a lot about God. He just doesn't like who God is. I go into every witnessing situation with that knowledge. My unbelieving friend is suppressing the knowledge of God. And God's witness cannot be completely extinguished. In apologetics, we call this the sense of deity. They push it down, they cover it, they deny it, but they can't extinguish it completely. Every unbeliever has a sense of deity. And that leads us to our next point, Roman numeral two. Be certain your approach in apologetics or witnessing uses the biblical point of contact. Now, the biblical point of contact would be God's claims upon us, his creatures. Now, I even, I even ask Christians this question. What do you owe God? And they usually say, gratitude. That's true. But you also owe God 
worship and complete conformity to his commandments. You owe that to God. You can't just say, hey, grace covers it all. Hey, okay, we're good. No, we owe God worship, submission, adoration, and complete conformity to his commandments. And so when I'm dealing with an unbeliever, I want them to know what they owe God. You see, the unbeliever has a controversy with God. He rejects what he owes God because he wants to be his own God. He wants to be autonomous from God. And so one of the beautiful things about regeneration, the new birth, is it slays the sinner's sovereignty. See, the sinner wants to be sovereign. I notice you've got a two ways to live tract in your re reception area there. And I love, the, uh, I love the pictures, the nomenclature in that tract. It shows the crown on the sinner's head and not on the head of the Lord. And so when we repent, the crown returns to where it belongs, on the Lord and not on us. Regeneration slays the sinner's sovereignty. So what is the point of contact with the unbeliever? God's claims upon that person. But also, the point of contact is the point at which the sinner has rebelled against God by suppressing the truth and by wanting to be his own God. So the question is, how do you go for that without committing a microaggression? How do you go for that? I'll give you another example. I was sharing the gospel at CalArts University. And I saw three men kind of laughing together. They weren't studying. They just had a table laughing outside. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll talk to these guys. I was by myself that day. I said, gentlemen, I'm from uh, Masters University, just talking to people about their worldview. The guy who's sort of the lead says, uh, hey, whatever you're selling, we're not buying. I could have walked away. But I said, I appreciate that. But I think in an institution like this, um, an arena of exchange of ideas is a good thing. Isn't that part of education? Okay, all right, all right. So I said, uh, can I ask you some questions about your worldview? And so I asked the four questions that I taught you guys Friday night. Where do we come from? What's the value of a human? What's gone wrong with the world? What can we do to fix it? So as we're talking, I set up the antithesis, the, the tension between truth and error. And... Uh, he said, look, I'm kind of a Spinozan solipsist, so don't try to take me down this road here because you're scuttling conversation by using absolutes. Okay, he's getting all philosophical on me. So I'm praying silently, Lord, what do I do? There's three guys on one here, and they're applauding their friend. And he goes, besides, he says, I've, I've dated a girl from Masters University once, and I found her pretty ignorant. She thought that the Bible, we should only read the New Testament and not the Old. So here's a guy who's pretty educated. So he made a few more statements about his philosophy, and I said, I'm, I'm praying silently, Lord, what can I do with this guy here? And all of a sudden it came to me. I said, has anybody ever showed you from Scripture what your worldview is? No. May I? Go ahead. I read Romans 1, 18 through 23 to him. And I'm not kidding. This guy who used to be so cocky, his, his posture changed. Now, most of you are too young to know what the RCA dog was. All right, some of you are laughing. You know what the RCA dog was? Okay. The RCA dog was in front of record stores, and it had a slogan on the bottom, his master's voice. In other words, RCA did such a great job of recording that the dog thought his master was talking instead of a record being played. And so the dog's head is cocked in the statue, the RCA dog. I'm not kidding. My friend took a posture of the RCA dog. As I was reading Romans 1, his head began to go like that. You know why? He was hearing his master's voice. His master's voice had just identified his worldview. His master's voice found where he was hiding. He's a truth suppressor. So, beloved, even with hardened guys like this, I'm challenging you, don't abandon a biblical point of contact. The Scriptures give it to us. Be hardened. The Holy Spirit will work through your efforts. And so we give a point of contact to the unbeliever that exposes his dilemma. He needs eternal life. 
He needs forgiveness, but he's on the run from God. He needs justification by faith, but he's running under heaven as a fugitive. I want to expose his predicament. I want to bring his dilemma to light so I can address it with the gospel. But I need a biblical point of contact first. The point of contact is not what is the brain capacity of Ramapithecus, supposedly one of the intermediate species between man and a primate. That's not the point of contact. The point of contact is not all his objections. The point of contact is the point at which he's on rebellion against God and suppressing the truth of God. We just have to learn how to do that and bring that up. So I use a number of scriptures with that. A lot of them are from Romans. In fact, that Romans road handout I gave you are some of the scriptures I use with the unbeliever. Roman numeral three. Because the faithful Christian apologist knows scripture, he knows the ethical condition of the unbeliever's mind. And that ethical condition is he is a studious truth suppressor, a very studious truth suppressor. And I want to bring that out. Uh, Letter A here, real quick. The Christian apologist is epistemologically self-conscious. He's going to refer to the starting point that he uses and the starting point that the unbeliever uses. He's going to refer to both of those starting points. And I'm I'm just sprinting through here. Letter B, uh, we must not tone down the confrontation between truth and error. Uh, We must not do that. And then finally, letter C, the apologist is, is, is able to appeal to the sense of deity that's at the very depth of the sinner's consciousness, but he seeks to suppress it. We want to appeal to that sense of deity for the, the unbeliever needs to hear his worldview from his own lips. Like I mentioned in a previous talk, that's part of conviction. Let me just close this segment with a brief story. Got a lot of them this weekend. <laughs> uh, one of my friends is a high up in the L.A. Police Department, and he said he wanted to go witnessing with me. And so I called him up, and he didn't call back. I called him up again, he didn't call back. Third time I called him, he goes, yeah, let's go now. And so we went to a local Starbucks, and uh, there was three different individuals at that Starbucks that I'd witnessed to before, and they were all willing to talk to us. But my police buddy Dave, he's got a different personality than I do. I'm kind of cerebral, and he's very warm and relational. And so we made a great tag team at Starbucks. I, 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 laid out, I laid out the facts of the gospel and the sinner's condition and everything else, and then we listened to the unbeliever's response. And all of a sudden, Dave, my police buddy, goes, he leans way over and touches the guy's arm. He goes, man, I'm really worried about your soul because you're an unbeliever. This is serious. Do you realize what would happen if you died tonight? Check it out. I, I, I can't talk that way, but my police buddy was. All three of these guys thanked us for our witness and said they look forward to the next time we come back. So bring a friend. Maybe a friend with a different personality than you. (laughs) It's a great way to tag team.